says is, is tending to the flock of his father-in-law. So, but to know where he's at then, you must first know where he come from. Because this day and time, we're such a people that is hung up. On our past, on our raising, on our parents, on our excuses, on our uh, living status, on our financial status, and our situation, that we are believing a lie of the enemy that we will only ever be this much. Yeah. Right or wrong? Yep. All right. So that's the problem that we're dealing with. And the problem is we say, I'm like this because. We got to get that out of our minds. We got to get that out of our heads. You're not like this because. You're like this because you want to be like this. That's why you like how you are. So who can change it? You can change it. Yeah, I'm going to get in your tail like a bicycle seat off today. Why? Because I'm sick and tired of seeing the believers not walking in the full promises of God and in the blessings of the life that he has prepared for them. God's got good stuff for us. Why? Because he's a good, good father. That's why. And I want to see y'all get your good stuff. Nothing would aggravate me more than for me to have something good for my kids. And I've had to do this and it ripped my heart. I would have something good or had already given something good, you know, say a bicycle four wheeler, you know, some kind of toy or something like that. But I would either get them something good or already have given them something good. But because of their actions, I had to revolt the privilege of the good thing. You know what I'm saying? And God's got a good thing that he wants to give to us. But because of our actions or lack of actions, should I say, all right, he has to hold it off. And he's sitting there with his heart torn up. And I mean, he's just on, I imagine he's not on pins and needles. God ain't moved by nothing. <laughs> but I imagine me, I'd be on pins and needles and stuff like that. I'm like, I just want to give you this good thing. Amen. You know, just do right. Amen. Just stop talking in school. Just do right. Amen. Just do right. Just clean your room. I got such a good thing I want to bless you with. But if I give it to you, then I'm going to bless your mess. I'm going to bless your disobedience. I'm going to bless your lack of servitude. I'm going to bless your lack of responsibility. I'm going to bless the lack of love that you have toward everybody else. And you're going to think that doing a bad thing gets blessed. Good. God, you are preaching. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So, And we blame so much stuff on our past on our parents, on our situation. And we sit there and believe that lie straight out of hell, out the enemy's mouth, in our ear holes for so many things. And we pass that down into generations. And that's the issue. We're not raising up kingdom generations. We're raising up cursed generations because those that are sitting here watching, my daddy never taught me much of nothing. I could probably count on one hand how many things my daddy actually said. Son, this is how you, he never even called me son. Boy, or whatever, this is how you do this. He never, if, if he did, I can count on one hand. Everything I know, I learned, most everything I know, I learned from my daddy. He never taught me one thing. It was by watching him. I would watch his hands. I see, I see him use a skill saw. I knew I could use a skill saw. I saw, I saw him. I, the first time I drove a straight drive car, I was 11 years old. Daddy brought this Datsun 210 home and said, boy, you think you can drive that? I said, oh, yeah. And why? Because I've been watching his feet in that 65 Chevrolet drive it straight drive. Boy, I knew, I knew how he was doing. Boy, I knew, saw that clutch. Boy, I'd be watching it. Boy, I was watching everything when I was a kid. Right? He brought that car home. He said, boy, you think you can drive that car? I said, oh, yeah, I can drive that car. He said, well, get it off the trailer. We're going to build your race car. I said, you got it. Boy, I got that thing ain't never even been in dots in my life. Well, I knew to match the clutch in. I knew to crank that thing up and I knew, I didn't know where the gear was, but I saw the R on there and I said, well, I said, that looks like a uh, reverse to me. 11 years old. 11 years old. This, I, you can't make this up. Put that thing in reverse. Ease out that clutch. Press that glass. Whoop. Never stalled it off that trailer. Put it in first. Shoop. Been driving a straight drive ever since. Why? Because I watched him. I watched him. Those that we're raising up are watching. They are watching. You might not be telling them, hey, you're generationally cursed. You might not be telling them, hey, you're going to argue with your spouse all your life. You might not be telling them, hey, you're going to have anger problems. But you are showing them by your actions that this is what you're going to be. Because they're watching. Whether you think they like you or don't, they're watching you. Why? Because you are their model. How you modeling? How you living? <laughs> How you living? <clears throat> and so if we look at Moses in the beginning, if, if anybody wanted to blame anything on anything. Now we're talking about Moses. You know, you know how I like to go backwards, all right? We're talking about Moses. Anybody know Moses? Anybody remember Moses? Are we too New Testament? We can't remember Moses. Moses. 
Moses that, 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 that smote the rock and water came out of it. Moses that went up onto the mountain and got the Ten Commandments that God spoke to. Moses that was so honored by God and feared by people because of the relationship that he had with God that when he come down the mountain, they couldn't even look upon him and say, hey, hey Moses, look here. Now, uh, uh, you want to talk with God, you just go, you talk to God, you come back and tell us what it is. We'll trust you. You know, and, 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 and while you're at it, let's put this bag over your head because we can't even see you like you're so bright. Good night. You know, this is the Moses we're talking about. If anybody had Moses that led millions from a person, all right, that answered to no one. Pharaoh answered to no one. He didn't have counsels. The DSS didn't go to Pharaoh's house talking about how you're treating your kids. You hear me? He, 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 he didn't have boards saying, hey, this would be a good He had soothsayers is what he had. You know what I mean? He had witchcraft all around him that, 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 was, that was counseling him in the demonic realm. That's what he had around him. He didn't have the stuff that we had. He didn't have judges and jurors and counsels and, 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 and whatever. You know, he, didn't, he did what he wanted to do. But Moses, sent by God, went to this man and led millions of people out. If anybody had a reason to say why they can't, it was Moses. I mean, after all, how many of us in here can say that we was put in a basket at three months old and put where the alligators are? Exactly. You got a better chance of living there, boy. Wow. Come on, somebody. Right Come on, somebody. Right how many of us can truly say that our life as a child was so bad? Wah, wah, wah. Because we cry babies. That our life was so bad that we got put in a basket. Go on. You got a better chance of the allocators than you got to live in here. But then like I told my daddy, only God with the stroke of his penmanship. So you got Moses' little sister over there looking from the sideline as the Pharaoh's daughter comes to take a bath in the same river that Moses is in. Only God can do this stuff, y'all. Only God. Only God can make you remember Psalms 91 when you can't even remember your own name. Only God can do this stuff. You're good, God. Yes, you're good. Mm. Try not to get in a praise fit. I can imagine Moses' mama's heart as she put him, because he was a goodly child. I can imagine his mama's heart as she put him in the basket. She's just like... I'm going to tell you, I couldn't. I couldn't. He just left it to the Lord. I don't, I don't know if that was fear or faith. But either way it was hard. On that mama. Okay. And then you got Moses' little sister over there watching from the sidelines saying, Hey, should I go get one of the Hebrew women? Because she, she found him, her and her mate. She's like, it's a baby. Look at him. Oh my goodness. Found him over there in the flag. Flag reeds or flag weeds or whatever it is. You know, found him over there. Now, I, I want to call it cattails. I don't know what it was like over there in, in Egypt. But anyway, found him on over there in the cattails, so to speak. It's just Richard. It's not word. Don't, don't take that as the word. That's, that's me. Read the story for yourself, chapter 1. And so Moses' sister runs up and says, Hey, should I go get a little Hebrew woman that she may feed him? Pharaoh started like, Yeah, go get a Hebrew woman. So then Moses' little sister goes running to mama. <laughs> And then mama gets paid to raise her own son. Only God can do these things. Only God can do these things. So Moses had good reasons. And then not only that, as, as he goes on through life, as he goes on through life, and then he gets into the situation where he's, well, it's, it's, it's messed up and my throat's sore. Is it bumping too bad? Well, Patrick's got a fat head and big neck. And, and mine ain't no more. Mine used to be, but it just ain't no more, right? And so, I'm going to have to get me a different kind. This one don't do me good. You just scratch it out. <laughs> so then, as life goes on for Moses, fast forward a little bit. He's sitting here looking out the window, watching the Egyptian and the Hebrew. And then it fires up something inside of him. I've said this. I've said it to so many people. I heard it. I didn't come up with it. Um, that's the only reason I know it. But when it got my ears folded down. Oh, okay. So I, I, I said this and, and, and I, I, I've heard it and I, I really live by it. 
whatever you got going on that on whatever you got going on on the outside is a reflection of what you got going on, on the inside. I think I heard T.D. Jake say that, and that is so true. That is so true. Your outside reflects what you got going on on the inside. If you're a mess, if you're unorganized, if you've got piles of crap, if you've got 15 unfinished projects, if, if you've got, you know, what, whatever, whatever you got going on, on on the outside, user reflects what's on the inside. And so here Moses is just sitting here looking out the window. How many times have we been sitting there looking out the window talking about, Lord, I wish you would move. I ain't going to do nothing but look out the window, but I wish you would move. But when Moses, I just put that in for free, it's pretty good. Wasn't it? But when Moses looking out the window, he sees the Hebrew and the, and, and the Egyptian fighting. And he's a Hebrew by blood, all right, but he's an Egyptian by raising. So what he is seeing on the outside is the same thing what's going on on the inside. And then he's torn, you know, because he sees his raising fighting against his bloodline, fighting against his heritage, you know, and he's like, this is what's been going on with me my whole life and I just can't take it no more. So he runs out there and he kills the Egyptian. Yeah. All right. And so, let me turn this off, y'all. My phone's been blowing up. And uh, so, he goes out there and he kills the Egyptian and he buries him in the sand. The, the, the King James Version said that he hid him in the sand. He buried him in the sand. How many times have we done done some dirt and then tried to hide that thing hoping nobody sees it? Yeah, yeah, we all guilty. It's okay. I'm guilty too with y'all. And so Moses went and killed the Egyptian because he was tired of feeling the way he felt, I believe. He, he was tired of feeling the way that he felt. He was tired of knowing deep down like I'm something different, but at the same time I got to be this because they say I got to be this. And just to battle so much like that, that was kind of the straw that broke the camel's back. So he goes and he slays the Egyptian stuff. And he thinks, I believe, by what the way that I read it, I believe that Moses thought at the time, like he because the Egyptian was slaying the Hebrew. And and I believe that at the time Moses thought that he was doing a good thing. Until the next day when the Hebrews come to him and said, Hey, you gonna you gonna slay us like you did the Egyptian? So it kind of backfired on him. He's like, hey, like you're my people. I did this for my people. So now Moses is on the run. Moses that crossed the Red Sea with a few million people on dry land is on the run. Moses that smoked a rock and water come forth is on the run. Moses that brought us the Ten Commandments by the finger of God is on the run. If anybody had a reason not to be great, it was Moses. All right? So go a little further. And Moses kept, uh, uh, verse 1 said, And Moses kept, the father, Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And if you want to know how he got a father-in-law from being on the run to being married now, then uh, read, read chapter 2. And it'll tell you just how. That's really good. But here's one thing that jumped off the page at me right here. That he's keeping his father-in-law's sheep. Right? But how they added in here the priest of Midianite. His father-in-law was the priest of Midianite. The Lord, all right, the Lord, who? The Lord. The Lord, even when you're on the run. The Lord, even when you've done a bad thing, all right? The Lord, even when your life's jacked up, will put the right people in your life. Amen. Who? The right. That's right. The Lord does this. Who? The Lord. Who? The Lord. Who? The Lord. Three of y'all believe me. Three of y'all going to heaven. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. That's up to you. That's up to you and the Lord. The Lord will put the right people in your life. And so here Moses is on the run. He's, he's, he's got a murder charge on him. He's got the Pharaoh that answers to nobody uh, after him. Done got a hit out on him and stuff like that. So he's running and he's taking a break by a well. And here comes these chicks and he's like, well, let me just help y'all. You know, I mean, I'm just sitting here anyway. And then because he wasn't looking out the window no more, he was carrying their water from the well. I wasn't even going to talk about it. Here it goes anyway though. But because he wasn't just sitting there, because he was actually trying to do something, then the Lord put it, hey, you're going the right way. While you're doing something, I'm going to go introduce you into some covering for a while. And then here Moses goes from this awesome Egyptian raisin, right? He wasn't wanting for nothing. He wasn't, I imagine Moses, and I don't know, this is just my crazy head, but I imagine Moses would be bald-headed, had a black around his eyes, you know, how we, how we think of Egyptians. He was raised as an Egyptian, but he was actually Hebrew, you know. 
How crazy would that be? So anyway, and on, on, on this run, God put a godly man in his life to help guide him. And then he's watching the, uh, his, his father-in-law sheep. Listen, where at? On the backside of the desert beside the mountain. It's not a bad thing. We might not get away from one verse. <laughs> Good night. Do what you do, though, Lord. The Lord can take one verse and change generations. So, I mean, hey, He can do it. The dry places and the hard places and the lonely places are not always the bad places. We have that twisted. Because the Bible says that in the last days and I believe we're right there that men shall call good things bad and bad things good and we do we call good things bad and bad things good and when we go through a dry place when we end up in a desert when we end up on the side of a mountain when, when we end up uh, in the valleys when we end up all alone and it's like we got nobody to turn to we're like oh well I'm, I'm, I'm really I'm, I'm really on the back side I'm, I'm, I'm really on the downside now you know Things just ain't good. Things just ain't good. Sometimes, just sometimes, the Lord has to allow you to be secluded. It was in my seclusion that I started knowing God. I asked the Lord to save me when I was 15. But I didn't know the Lord. I knew his I knew I knew what it felt like. Like when when his spirit entered the place. Like I knew that love. I knew that uh I knew that that cry, just that hallelujah, you know, just I feel like I got electricity running through, but I didn't understand, you know, I just felt. You know what I mean? I knew that. I had felt that. But it wasn't until I was thirty, until I truly started knowing the Lord because it wasn't until I was 30 that I had to be totally secluded all I had was four kids and I didn't have anybody else speaking their opinions their thoughts or, or anything else in my life and thank God because it felt like a, such a dry place it felt like such a valley it felt like such a mountain climb for me but thank God because it was that place that transformed my life it was that place where the Lord could truly speak to me. And it wasn't just a hallelujah and, and, and all this. I mean, it, it, it was such a more... That's where the Lord in the cool of the day. <laughs> that's where the conversations started beginning with me and the Lord. That's whenever I learned that I can just talk to the Lord how I talk to the Lord. I have told the Lord that fart stunk. <laughs> if it's a lie, I ain't standing here. I know, Tim. I know. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I did. That's all I'm talking to. I got four kids. I'm just talking to the Lord all the time. All, I had a toothache one time. This is how real it is. I had a toothache one time. My tooth was pounding. I ain't had nothing. I ain't. I mean nothing. So I mean I'm just suffering. I mean I, I am suffering. And I picked up uh, a swat. I was sitting there watching the kids. Was living in this kind of junky trailer, and and the grass was real high. And I I reached down and I picked me up a swab of grass. Pluck that grass up, and I put. The, and I said, "Lord, I said I want you to anoint this grass." I said, "Because you, I, if I'm lying, I ain't standing here. <laughs> that is no job." I said, "Lord, I want you to anoint this grass because I ain't got no pain meds, I ain't got no car, I ain't got no dentist, and I ain't got no. I need you right now, Lord, because I ain't got nothing else." And and God is my witness. Well, I put that grass in my mouth, start chewing on that grass. That tooth, that tooth ain't. That tooth has not ached since that day. Now you tell me God ain't real. You've come too late. I've done seen it. So that's why I'm a little not wrapped tight like I'm a little not wrapped tight. You know what I'm saying? Because I just uh, converse with the Lord all the time. You know, I'm just talking to the Lord so much. He touched my buddy. I ain't even realized. I'm like, Ooh, Lord, I'm sorry. That fart stunk. I'm serious. Dead serious. You know, that's what it is, man. Get with him. You know, he loves me enough. He don't mind smelling my farts. Hmm? That's for free. So the desert and the mountains are not always a bad place. The desert and the mountains is where you can truly get with the Lord on that intimate level. And then, because the beautiful thing about it, here's the beauty about it, when you get broken down, there ain't no way to go but up at that time. That's the only way to go. 
And then it's at that time where you know that you can first, you can trust the Lord. You know that. Yeah. Second, you know you can't trust nobody else. Amen. Nobody else. What was that I was reading the other night? Uh, uh, Psalms 118 talking about don't, don't trust uh, princes and don't look that up. We Psalms 118. Um, yeah. Yeah, we'll read a couple verses of that. And stuff. But it's at that place where you know that you can't trust nobody else. And it's that place where you know that you can truly trust the Lord. And it's that place the Lord starts building. And it's just kind of like an empty truck bed. And you got the thing backed up there. And you're just like one brick. And you're stacking it nice and neatly. Two bricks. And that's how the Lord does with you. Whenever you're at that place, you're the empty truck bed. And the Lord is the brick stacker. He's saying faith humility you've been so stinking prideful I ain't been able to talk to you in 20 years I've been waiting on this so I'm going to take advantage humility genuinity love for your neighbor y'all ready oh center block hang on let me get the center block <clears throat> love for yourself that one rocks the truck a little bit. Love for yourself. A lot of us don't love ourselves. A lot of us don't know how to love ourselves. But God loves you. He loves you right where you're at. He loves you stinking breath and all. He loves you with all your junk. He loves you with all of your mistakes. He loves... <laughs> He loves you with all of your own purposes. Yeah. He loves you with your nasty attitude self. He loves you when you're conniving. He loves you when you're sneaking around. So when did God love you? God loves you before you ever arrived here. His love for you is already love. Before you ever got here. Before you was a thought. Before your mama's 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 mama was a thought. He already loved you in 2022 then. That's His love. We have God's love limited in our minds because we're believing a lot of people. We're, we're, we're believing this quick exchange kind of thing. You know what I mean? We're believing this, oh, let me bless you with $20. And then in the back of your mind, you're thinking, oh, I blessed them with $20. I bet they're going to be blessed me with $30. <laughs> you know what I mean? And we don't give anything out of, uh, out of a genuine heart. You know what I mean? We don't give love out of a genuine heart. Not really. Because think about the motives of everything that you do. If anything that you do, because why God looks upon the heart. If anything you do is for the reciprocation, if anything you do is for the comeback, if anything that you give is for the comeback, then it's in naught. It's in nothing. When the Lord was talking about the tithes and the Lord was talking about giving and stuff like that, He was talking about a genuine giving. That's what He was talking about. And that's what the Lord expects from us believers if we will be genuine with people when we give our love. And when we give, I have told so many people here lately, like, man, thank you so much. And I meant that thing. And I'm just like, I just want to give you anything I got. Like, I just have, that's how much I really appreciate you. Like, I just want you to just have to walk out of here with hand trucks and stuff carrying things because I just want to just show my affection because I genuinely appreciate you that much. We don't appreciate people, y'all. And what are blessings? Relationships. But we don't appreciate people, but the blessings are in the relationships. But we're so busy running, trying to make our own name, trying to leave our own mark. Let me tell you something. Don't nobody give a crap about your mark. It's, 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 it's a lie inside of your head. How do I know? Because I spent a lot of my life trying to make one. We are here for a purpose. And the purpose is not to leave our mark. The purpose is to not leave what we built, what we are to build is love, faith, long-suffering in relationships. Good marriages are supposed to create more good marriages. Good daddies are supposed to help other good daddies. Good mamas are supposed to build other good mamas. You know what I mean? Elder women are supposed to help young. That's what we're to be doing. We're missing the mark, y'all. We're talking about money, blessing, money, blessing, money. Oh, the Lord's going to put a financial blessing. Oh, watch me look good. Man, get that crap out of here. Get back to the basics. Why are we here? We're not here. Money is a tool. That's right. 
A tool. That's all it is. There is no difference in a million dollars and a nine sixteenths wrench. None. Money is a tool. A tool to do things with. That's all it is. It's not to be hoarded up. It's a tool to do things. It's to do kingdom things with. Amen. And we have gotten so sidetracked. And I'm not, I don't even know why I'm even talking about money so much today. I don't even think about it like that. But I, I, here we are, nevertheless. So it must be something to be talked about. Because I had a lot of things I want to talk about. <laughs> and I want to talk about. But God, who is rich in mercy. We've just gotten so far off the beaten path. But we, here's the good news. Here's the good news. Here's the good news. All right. You hear a lot of preachers come up and be like, blah, 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 blah. here's the good news. We can change. I hit you right in the face, didn't I? I mean, it was so good you didn't even know it. You're like, I mean, really? Because that's how it is. Did it only hit only a couple people like that? We can change. Yeah. We don't have to be how we've been. We can change. We don't have to continue believing the lies that we've believed all of our lives. We can change. We don't have to continue being stagnant Christians looking out the blinds. Wonder who's going to win, the Hebrew or the Egyptian. We can change. We can change. We can, what I'm trying to tell you, folks, is we can do this. And like, I, I don't know if you're pick, picking up what I'm, what, I'm, what I'm putting down. I don't put Emily to sleep, which I usually do. But I don't know if you're picking up what I'm putting down. I see you sleeping, girl, all the time. I'm going to start throwing a book at you. That's all right. I'm playing with you. A little bit, not much. But... The good news is, like, I don't know if we really believe this, that we can do this. We can really do this. I don't know. And I, mean, I just want to speak to your heart right now. And, and, and I just, I, I feel like this is it. I don't know, I don't know but I mean, I feel like, like this is just, this is it right here. Because this is really what I feel so heavy right now to, to leave you with. Like, we can really do this. I know we don't believe it. And I know we might not know exactly how. You think Moses on the backside of a desert? Knew how to make water come from a rock. You know? And let, let me try to... Let me, let me try to... I'm trying to see what make it do it. And I'm, I'm, I'm just going to recap because there's one thing that, that, that I want to tell you. There's one thing I want to read for you. But just going through this, going through this chapter 3, you know, most on the back side of this desert, right? And, and on the back side of the desert, he's, uh, I found it. It's over. Yep. It's got to be clipped to your shirt. Yeah. I knew I'd find it if I keep. That's what it is. My collar. On, on, the back, on the back side of the desert, when Moses is probably feeling like he's in a low place, all of a sudden he sees this burning bush. And the an angel of the Lord spoke to, the, spoke to Moses from the bush. He said, Moses, Moses, put off your shoes for the place you're standing on is holy. You know? But the crazy thing is, is, is but before he did that, fix my hair. Before he did that, in verse 3, whenever Moses saw the burning bush, Moses said, uh, I will now turn aside. <laughs> and then in verse 4 it says, And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called out unto him and said, uh, said out, of the, out of the middle of the bush, all right, and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. In verse 5, he, uh, uh, he said, talking about God, and God said, draw not hither, don't come close, but put your shoes off before you come on over here, because the place that you are standing on is holy ground. We still serve a holy God, y'all. I need to remind y'all that. We still serve a holy God. It just ain't an Old Testament he was holy. It ain't just a, uh, in, 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 the, in the 1930s. It ain't just at Azusa, at Azusa Street. It ain't just at revivals whenever the apostles and prophets and stuff and, and, and everything come to town and, and miracle workers and all that. God is still as holy as he's always been because he don't change. He ain't changed from being holy. We've just changed our, our thinking a lot. We don't believe that he is who he says he is truly, 
fully because if we did we wouldn't be sitting on our duff so much we would be letting him work through our lives and we would be doing everything we could to help every relationship that we can get our hands on and that's the truth of it so in verse 6 he says uh, uh, God introduced himself he said I'm, I am the God of thy father the God of Abraham the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob and Moses hid his face for he was afraid to look upon God in verse 7 it says and the Lord said I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt and have heard their cries by reason of their taskmaster and know and I, for I know their sorrows. The Lord has heard your cries. The Lord hears your cries. The Lord knows where you're at. The Lord knows your sorrows. The Lord knows everything about you. That's the good news. And we believe that the Lord don't care about us because we've been like this. There used to be a song, I come to expect this from you. <laughs> you know, I feel like the Lord knows that about it. He, he come to expect it because He knows all things. He's not surprised by us acting goofy. And he said, I am come down, God said, and I am come down to deliver them out of the land of the, out of the, land of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land unto a good land and a large and a large unto a land flowing with milk and honey unto the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Parasites and the Hevites and the Jebusites. Alright? So I have made them to dwell in a land, but currently, uh, I don't know if Moses knew this or not yet, but currently giants live there. But anyway, I made them to live in this land right here. Why? Because God is a promise keeper. God is a covenant God. Everything uh, God told Abraham that he was going to do, he said, Abraham, he said, I'm going to bless your seed. I told, I prayed this over my daddy. I told my daddy this other day in the Holy Ghost. I said, God's going to bless your seed and your seed, seed, and your seed, seed, seed. I said, in the word of the Lord, because of what you've put in, will be coming for generations. So you can go on and do what you got to do because it's God that does the blessing. God keeps his word. Even whenever his children, even whenever his people, and he's hearing their cries and stuff, he's hearing, he's attending to their cries, but he's remembering his covenant because he's a covenant God so whatever he said he's going to do through you I don't care how long it takes or how it works out he's going to do it through you Amen. we got to remember that God is a promise keeper I'm trying I'm not trying to get wound up and keep it a thing it's kind of messing me up Jack and uh it wasn't much yeah my throat was hurting real bad and so the thing it, it keeps keeps sidetracking me I don't like it all right and the thing is <clears throat> God said, hey, I'm sending you to this land. Now, therefore, behold, verse 9, therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel is come unto me. This is God speaking. And I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppressed them. The Lord knows when we're oppressed, y'all. He ain't stopped looking. He ain't did this just for them. He still ain't stopped looking upon us. Verse 10 says, come now, therefore, unto, come now, therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh that thou mayest bring forth my people, my children, my people, the children of Israel out of Egypt. And Moses said unto God, who am I? How many times do we say that? We get this hankering, I like to say. We get this feeling like, like I feel like I'm just supposed to do something bold. You know what I mean? I feel like I'm supposed to do something big. And then we get to think, oh Lord, who am I? Man, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. I better call myself down. I'm going to hurt myself. You know what I mean? But that's because that's that calling trying to rise up in you and you keep shutting it down. And it's trying to rise up and you keep shutting it down. Why? Because we're scared. We don't know what it looks like. Stephanie's like, hell yeah. I said, honestly, I said, I feel like, a, I feel like there's, I feel, but it only, I feel like I'm walking down the darkest path ever. You know, not, not just with my daddy, just in life. I feel like I'm walking down a pitch dark path always. And I can see about five feet in front of me. And that's good enough. That's good enough. Yep. Come on, no, no, no. Tag, tag, tag. Do it, do it. The word of God says that His word is a lamp unto my feet, a light to my path. The lamp is only to cover the certain perimeter of what you can see. Yeah, yeah. So when you walk and you only can see where you're supposed to go to, so you look too far down the road, come on, and you get lost. That's the problem. Come on. Look where you're supposed to go to. You gotta go off each step by step, knowing that that yeah. word is guiding your step, and that word is what's enlighten you, regardless of all the darkness around you. You see the perspective of what you need to be at at the precise time. Even when you're sitting still, that's where you're supposed to be at. Yeah. Just having the faith, knowing that, knowing the path, that the path is, the path is exactly. You need to worry exactly. about those parameters. 
Exactly. Amen. Exactly right. <laughs> I've been wanting to do it. I've been wanting to do it. I want to do it fully though. Because the cool thing about it is if the lamps shine more than five feet and you see the giants down the road, then you liable to quit. You liable to tuck tail and run back. So the Lord can't show you but this much at a time. He can't give you but this much at a time. You're like, Lord, give me all you got. And he's like, well, if I did, you'd run. You'd quit. You'd die. You know, you'd come up with a reason. You know, and, and, and that's just what we do so many times. And I want to read it. That way you hear it out of the word, not just out of my mouth. God told Moses everything he was going to do. And he is flipping Moses' wig. So God had to prove himself to Moses. That's why he said, what you got in your hand there, boy? Moses said, a staff. He said, throw it down. He threw it down. It became a snake. Moses fled. That's the word. Read it. Chapter 3. Moses fled. God said, hold up, boy. How many times when danger comes do we want to flee? And the Lord said, pick it up by the tail. He said, reach down there and grab it by the tail. You pick it up by the tail. <laughs> so many times we get punked when danger comes in our lives. And the Lord said, hey, grab by the tail. I tell my kids, grab by the throat. Yeah, I tell them, that's what I do. Grab by the throat. You coming out one way or the other. Either by your will or by the throat. Whichever one you want to do. I'm good for both. And... The staff turns into a snake. God says, pick it up by the tail. I got this thing wrote. And then when he picked it up by the tail, it turned back into the staff. Because God was having to build Moses' faith so he would be strong enough and, and confident enough to know that this God that he has met now will do what he says. There. Because God's telling him all these things he, he's going to do. And they're big things, y'all. You know, I mean, there's big, huge things, you know. I'm just, I come, Patrick, Patrick, check it out, man. I want you to go to this dude that will kill you, and I want you to lead all these people out and stuff like that. Now, listen, uh, we, we ain't sending uh, school buses air conditioned, and, and, and we're not going to have cooks and nothing like that or anything. But just go get them. T tell them I've been hearing them. Go, go get them. And say, <laughs> yeah, so Moses coming up with all these reasons. And the part that I was trying to get to that I really want to tell you is i got to read it. I can't just tell it to you. The Lord won't let me. And I don't want to because I don't want to shortchange you all because you're worth it. And so the, Lord, the Lord's doing all these great miracles to and through Moses and in front of Moses so that he can believe the Lord. And the Lord's telling him what he's going to do to Pharaoh. And he's telling him what all he's going to do in the land. Right? Y'all with me so far? And this is the part, this is, this is where I want to get right here because this is where I feel like, and I'm going to shut up after this. Really? Promise? Oh, yeah, y'all doing good. Y'all ain't beat the First Baptist, but y'all doing good. It's all right. We're already halfway through a fast. You're halfway through a day. Yeah. Verse 10. Verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 10. This is where a lot of us are at. The Lord done told Moses all these great things that he sent him to do. He's then told everything. He's then showed him what he would do through him. He's then showed him his amazing power. He's then showed him his ability to keep him on the task that he is sending him for. And even after all that, here Moses is talking, and this is us a lot of times. Verse 10, uh, chapter 4. And Moses said unto the Lord, O oh my Lord, I'm not elegant, neither heretofore, nor since thou art thy servant. But I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. Still coming up with excuses not to be great is what I read right there. How many of us are still coming up with excuses not to be great? I'm just going to... And, oh, and I love this. And then the Lord said unto him... He's, he's giving the Lord his excuse why he can't go do great things for the Lord that the Lord has already prepared him to do and showed him that he'll keep him while he does it. And then in verse 11, And the Lord said unto him, Who made man's mouth? Or who maketh the dumb, or deaf, or the seeing, or the blind? Have not I the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be with thy mouth. And teach thee what thou shalt say. 
I'm going to leave it right there. I'm going to leave it right there. Because we're always trying to give our little rebuttal. We're always trying to give our little two cents on why we can't be great for the Lord. Lord, we can't do it because of this. Can't do it because of that. Can't do it because I don't know it because I ain't never seen it done and stuff like that. And the Lord's saying, who do you think I am? Like, you think I don't know these things? You think I don't know where you're at? You think I don't see your inside struggles? You think I don't see the things that keep you up late at night? You think I don't see the things that weigh so heavy on your mind when you're driving down the road and 5, 10, 15 miles get behind you and you ain't even realize you drove that far because your mind's so heavy with all your concerns in life? You think that I don't look upon that? You don't think I don't see you crying at night? You don't think I ain't violing your tears up? Because I am everyone that falls. Because they're precious to me. Because of my love towards you. Because I am your God. I'm not your dictator. I'm your God. I'm your heavenly Father. And I'm a good Father. I want good for you. I have good things set for you. You are my beloved. Beloved means much loved. You are my much loved. I want to cradle you in my arms. My arms won't hurt you. My arms won't go against your will. I have loving, healing hands. I don't have hands of molestation. I have nurturing hands. And I want to nurture you right where you're at. And that's His whole deal for us. And we, we think so long, we got to get it right. we got to get it right. I'm not doing enough. I'm not doing good enough. Yeah, faith without works is dead. But there is no hope in tradition either. It ain't about your church attendance. The Lord's just like, I just want to talk to you. Like, will you turn the radio off for just a second? I tell my kids sometimes, and they'll be going, 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 and going, and going, and I'm like, hey, I we got a bell in the center of the house. When that bell rings, everybody knows, report to the center of the house. Ding, ding, ding. Report to the center of the house. Because we're either having a family meeting at supper time or prayer time. But report your butt, stop what you're doing, and report to the center of the house. Time to have a get together. And I tell Stephanie sometimes, I'm like, ring that bell, baby. Report that report to the center of the house. Report to the center of the house. <laughs> I want to talk to you. Because that's what I tell my family, get to the center now. Because there's times where I don't give a crap what you're doing. Cut off the game. Cut off the TV. Cut off, I don't care how much homework you say you got. You ain't doing none of it anyway, you lie. You up there on YouTube. Get that crap out of here. Huh? I'm old school. I was lying to my parents way before you thought about lying to me. Come on. Get that mess out of here. And the Lord's saying, I just want to speak with you. Because that's the love that I have towards you. And I know these things hurt you. But I can heal that hurt. Hannah wouldn't even look at me earlier. She's being mean to me. She said, I'm not going to look at you. I hate you. That's a lie. She didn't say she hated me. She said she can't look at me. And she started trying to make me cry. She said, because I know, I know the hurt that you feel. And I just hugged her. I said, well you know the hurt then you know his peace Amen. ain't God good yes. if you know the hurt then you know his peace that peace that passes all understanding yes, y'all can do this I'm going to try my best to look every single one of y'all right in the face just so you know who I'm talking to well where, where, who's talking to I'm talking to you Slap so your neighbor and say, he's talking to you. He's talking to you. I'm making sure everybody in here, I don't care if you want to look at me or not, I'm looking at you. You can do this. You can do this. I don't care what it's been like, and I don't care what you're thinking. You can do this. God's got such good things for you. Spend some time with him. Spend some time with him. I, just, I want to play a song. I want to pray for you and anybody else that... I got a phone? Yeah. I just want to play this song 
because it's my song that's been um, ministering to me all week. I don't even got to look for it because it's right there. We don't care about no ostrich. And if you want to if you want to come up and pray, come up and pray. If you want to get prayed for, come on. Let's pray for you. And if you want to pray for somebody else, you I want you to be led by the Lord in His love.